Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another Let's Discuss with Parsons TKO. Today, I am, well, I'm as always, I'm Tony Kopechny, your host, uh, CEO, co-founder of Parsons TKO. We're a digital consulting company, uh, remote-based, uh, which we're definitely going to get into today, and I'm super delighted to be here with my friend, Andrew Courtney, who is currently at uh, National Geographic, and uh, he and I get together and have the most amazing conversations about I'd like to say that it's always turned to big ideas. Um, and over lunch, I think maybe about a month ago now, we started getting into biomimicry. Uh, and it really got me thinking. And so I thought this would be a great topic for our audience. So, uh, Andrew, if you want to introduce yourself as well. Sure. Um, thanks, Tony. Yes. Um, yeah, I, you know, I always struggle with like what kind of an intro to, to give. Um, but uh, my background is is certainly pretty broad. I've spent a lot of time in technology and communications. Um, I think what I'm most known for, though, and, and this is where I get the most consternation, I'm most known for like project management, right? Mm. And that's um, it's a role that I think most people would expect just in, in general from anyone who's, who's able to get results done these days. The, the strength I think I really bring, though, is that ability. And I think you've got this common in some of your other guests that really take those complicated, um, chaotic ideas, put some structure and order around it, and then figure out how to move it forward so that you can get something at, at the other side that um, meets the goals and, and gives you enough clarity on what's working, what's not, so you can kind of keep adjusting and keep pivoting. Um, right now, I work at National Geographic. I've spent a good chunk of my career in the conservation space um, before National Geographic was at the Nature Conservancy and, and also at United Way. Um, but the role I have right now is, it's an odd fit. We're leading a policy campaign at National Geographic. So we have an organization that you think of in terms of storytelling and, and um, education and exploration. And we're really trying to influence global policy uh, to, to convince world leaders to protect at least 30% of the planet by 2030. Uh, so we can, we'll see if that comes in or not, but it's a pretty interesting, um, that in and of itself is an interesting case study. It's a big idea and it's quite ambitious. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah, yeah. I think that's how we got started. It was like, you want to talk about audacious. How might you protect 30% of the planet by 2030? Um, yeah. So I, I mean, let's, let's start on that one point you talked about with the, the PM, the project management capability. I think I'd agree that in my career too, that's what people liked about me, but I, I'm not a trained, I don't have a PMP certification. Yeah. I always felt it was like, how do you put a plan together? Think about the obstacles, think about dependencies, and then yeah. get everybody on board? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, it's always, it's kind of come back to like, you got to fall in love with the problem you're trying to solve. So you better, mm. find, you know, figure out how to get to organizations where you're going to be solving worthwhile problems, you know? Um, that was a good quote there, though. You had said you need to fall in love with the problem you're trying, you're trying to solve. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, um, that's that has helped me throughout much of my own navigation. Like I, I've, it, it might sound a little corny, but I've always um, thought of myself as a as a believer in a better future that balances the needs of people and planet. And so, that's really been kind of a guiding principle for me in terms of how I've pieced together my career. It's definitely not been a linear path at all, right? Like my not at all, but that has always kind of guided which sort of skills I pick up and, and where I'm trying to go. Um, and, you know, help me figure out and find ways to fall in love with some of the ugliest problems, you know, because sometimes you get handed something that is just not at all what you expected. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you know, you can find a way to really align that specific issue with things that really matter and kind of help you fulfill your own vision. Hmm. So yeah, it's uh, I really like that phrasing you had there. Someone had asked me once when I was working in house in an organization, you know, hey, you, you're you're a little younger, but you moved up the track. How did you do this? What what was your secret? I was like, mm -hmm. I don't care about taking the credit. Yep. I mean that yeah. was it. Uh, I just I wanted to get things done. Yes. Uh, yes. And I, but I like the way you phrased it. I think yeah, it was a a love of the problem. But uh, how do I bring the best people and the best minds together Yeah, where everyone can feel some ownership? And if they need to be the lead and take it, they can take it. But let's, let's, get, it, let's get it done and do it together. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that, that winding. Imagine, yeah. Like that's it's it's that facilitative role, mm. less about. And I'm similar to you in that, like the whole PMI stuff. It never worked for me. I'm skeptical of it um, because it just sort of I think it boxes you in, and, and you know it's like book knowledge, right? Can you study and, and memorize you know certain things? Great, but um, but are you more comfortable? collaborating with people on messy things, helping them understand really what it is that you're trying to get done and then trusting them to come out with the best idea. So their expertise really gets to shine, you know, and you're mostly just sort of the, the, the guiding hand. Um, so I think, you know, just for posterity's sake, I mean, it is March 17th, 2020. We are at the green shirt. Aaron Cobra, <laughs> uh, got a little bit of green on there. We, um, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, new, new, new time of, of being for us here, uh, just with the shutdowns and everything that's happening, this remote mm-hmm. work. But I was, I was reading just before we got on to do this, where China was, the U.S. is blaming China and China's blaming the U.S. And, you know, the next thing you're going to see come out for me on LinkedIn is let's just remove the word blame. Mm-hmm. If people are getting sick, they're getting sick. And I got to be willing to say, I believe the scientific community wants to collaborate together across borders. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people want to figure this out. And, and mm-hmm. th- those are the big ideas that get me excited. I, I think for too long, it's been, we've thought too small ball, even within our own countries, within our own companies, within everything. And there, there is radical change that needs to happen. And the moment is being forced on us. And I'm, I'm curious, too, as we get into this, too, we, you know, you and I have talked a bit about this interdisciplinary role and how do we make work function together? How do we facilitate and bring people together? How, yeah. do, you, how do you integrate the work? You know, Parsons TKO, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this because we would come in and yeah. you probably had these conversations. I mean, I think like five or 10 years ago, we we're talking digital ecosystems. Yeah. And I just, I didn't like the, the word didn't feel right, but the context made sense. It was the only yeah. way I could describe it. You know, we came up at parts of TKO with engagement architecture, yeah, which is systems, people process, but with a purpose of getting an audience and building affinity. Mm-hmm. But in doing that, what we realized is those tools span an entire organization where they felt like they came out of the communications or marketing department, or maybe the fundraising unit. And really it's all of these groups have to be stakeholders in a process that can get integrated. And so yeah. we've been talking about what's that middle role, what's that integrator role that I, you know, it, if you're just a PMP, I know that sounds bad, but for all the PMPs out there, I'm sorry, I don't mean it that way. Uh, it is very valuable. I mean, and we need that discipline yeah. skill. Yeah. I think what Andrew and I are saying is we don't have your skill set uh, or the capacity to yeah. probably do what you do on a detailed yeah. attention to detail level what we're talking about is where's that sort of messy middle person who can look at all of it or what that role is. Yeah. It almost feels more essential now than ever, as I think a lot of groups are going to start rethinking what's our business plan today. I I mean, I tend to think that that's exactly right. Like at least that's been my experience and it's been born out of honestly, out of a lot of insecurity initially, right? Like this, Mm -hmm. the first time I got thrown into this kind of integrator ish um, situation was that, PBS about 10 years ago when they were going through their major, are we going to make it uh, moments when viewership was down, YouTube was taken over and they were way behind the times trying to make it work with antiques roadshow delivered over the air, you know? Right. Right. Um, And a dying demographic. I mean, these are all very familiar things. And so I was there at that time when, when the organization was one laying off people left and right, trying to rethink how to deliver uh, broadcast content, over the internet, making it, you know, digital video on demand. And, and that was just like the first time I got thrown into that stuff, I really felt very insecure because I, I loved the newness of it and the meatiness of like, how do you get this done? But it was also like, my God, we haven't been here before. And that you felt like somebody, it, it felt like we should know how to do this. You know what I mean? Like, huh? or, or there was this lack of like rigor. Um, and, and it wasn't until I shifted over to the Nature Conservancy when I realized most of this stuff, you know, it's, it's like, it's wayfinding. You know, I think we've talked about this too, where you're, you've got a general plan that's, just, that's helpful and you've got a roadmap and that's helpful, but you can't get too attached to like the exact specific um, 
day by day tactics, right? Like they just kind of unfold and you have to be ready to, to pivot quickly. Um, and this, you know, this isn't true for all projects. There are certainly like major enterprise projects where you want to have tighter controls, but for these things where it's like, it's kind of messy and there's a lot at stake and you're in unknown territory, um, you end up having to, to kind of work with a lot of people quickly and your ability to be successful comes down to whether or not those relationships can hold together. You know, like do people feel that their voice is heard and their contributions are valid? Or are they feeling so attached to the old way of doing things that they no longer want to share or be part of um, thinking about what the future looks like or, or bringing about that change, you know? Like some yeah. of the transformation talks we've, talked, we, we, we've had, there's, there's just always that, um, that tension between those that are really ready to dive in, move things forward, and then there's the individuals that are kind of holding things so close, they can almost, not quite sabotage, but they kind of detract from the inevitable change. Hmm. Yeah. Wow, so there's, oh man, there's a lot of stuff you said that I really liked right there. <laughs> uh, Get on a roll. Especially the one where it was, it felt like we should have known how to do this. Uh -huh. Like I, we could unpack that for a while, because I, with, all you know i've worked in-house and I'm, I'm running my own company now doing consulting and I, everywhere i go everyone's like oh i bet but everyone else has this figured out and i'm like no actually no one does and i that phrasing again you just use really brings it home because it's i maybe that's even some of that where some of the deflation and the motivation comes from is just man i felt like i should have been should have known what to do. I felt like i should have known what to do when a virus hit i felt like i should have known what to do when youtube came or when I needed to take my events online, but like, no, it's okay. And I, I think you're right. I think we always, because when technology gets involved, we expect everything to be a one and a zero. Mm -hmm. We expect it to be real quick and it, it's right or wrong when it's like yeah. your, your wayfinding example, I think is probably right uh, yeah. for the current moment we're living through and, and just organizational transformation. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's, um, there, there are no maps, right? There's really no map. Like there are references and you've got some landmarks and, but you're still kind of like, is North there, is it there? And you're trying to get to the next point. And then you, you know, you pull your team together and it's like, are, are things still valid? I mean, definitely now with COVID-19, right? Like this has absolutely just obliterated, I'm sure for millions of people, like whatever you thought you were going to be doing next quarter is now very different, let alone, well, goodness, even day to day, hour to hour. Um, I mean, that's what we're living through right now with our, with our campaign project at, at Nat Geo, right? It's last week at this time, how might we convince heads of state of the 196 UN sanctioned countries to publicly support protecting at least 30% of the planet by 2030? That was our goal, right? Biodiversity. We want biodiversity. And now it's like, does that come across as tone deaf to be out there talking to world leaders about, hey, you gotta stand up for biodiversity when their economies, their countries, their people are quite literate. You know, this is, this is a pandemic and this is unheard of. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So, you know, those are conversations we have right now. We, ha we have active debate on, on there's, the, there's the camp of stay the course, we've got momentum, we gotta keep it up. And then there's the, you know, the view that perhaps we might need to give it some space, adjust our messaging a little bit, or, you know, um, even um, not quite pack it up, but hit pause for a while. So um, I kind of pivoted there from you a bit. It was, you know, there's this, this like, there is that, that challenge when things are changing so quickly and there's so much volatility. You know, where do you put all of your energy and effort? Do you want to invest in meticulous project plans that you know are, are capturing a moment in time that by the time you've thought it out is already irrelevant you know or do you need to just have enough of a of a direction and, and that's how for me anyway that's kind of where i've been setting things up lately like I, so this gig at nat geo previously when i was over at united way it was a similar setup there of a big that one was a, a transformation anchored more in technology with the partnership with salesforce but it was super audacious as well. Like how do you get 1800 local United ways, you know, bound together 
on a digital transformation to shift how they fundamentally do their core business work. Um, small, and small effort. It was not at all small. And there was internal tension. You know, we had we had the uh, executive team wanting to see the masterminded project, right? Like, I want to see 40 pages of rows and timelines and milestones and subdiv- you know, all that kind of stuff. And then there's me where it's just sort of like, okay, <laughs> this is big and we need to kind of like get the general gist of where we're trying to go get some interim things that help us move in the right direction and then pick our head up again in the next quarter and see what worked, what didn't and what, you know, where do we set the sights? I'm not saying that's any better. I'm just saying that for me at work, it helps put my energy less on the details that may not even materialize and more on focusing towards outcomes that can help build, you know, build the win. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Again, just so much in there to unpack. I mean, it, it's making me think, when you had talked about the executives want that detailed plan, they want to know where it's exactly going to be at what time and how it's going to happen. And yeah. I mean, the truth is it's probably yeah. impossible to give them that, you know, yeah. it, uh, you read the Washington post the other day and the epidemiologists are like, it depends. Yeah. I, I can't yeah. tell you, but yeah. it's making, it's making me think too here about how, how organizations use data too and analytics and how we're monitoring our performance on these pathways, which is, it shouldn't be seen as a definitive answer, mm-hmm. right? It just needs to be a health check. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like if you're wayfinding, are we still in a good place or are we really off course? Did we yeah. have like, yeah, we always do these projects and we'll start with what's your goal? I, mean, I know my goals. Okay, well, let's state them, right? Well, how would you get to that objective? And you even said the word outcomes and that, that's a lot where I'm trying to steer a lot of conversations these days is what's the desired outcome? Yeah, I don't know how you're going to get there exactly right now at this moment. I don't know if it's a plane, train, an automobile, a boat, or for what. Right, right. It doesn't, know, even, you know. it doesn't matter. Yeah, I know we. Can, I know that's what you want to get to. I know this is the desired state. Do we know why that's the desired state? Now we have the motivation. Let's get this thing done. Mm-hmm. You know, and how to? And I guess just how do we continue to adapt that in organizations? And your United Way example there. Um, you know, sometimes I don't know if I'm the the kid crying wolf in this story but i i think i do think there is going to be a consolidation in the mission driven sector because of the way that i've seen the funding mechanisms from philanthropies and you know the wealthy uh, that are donating in it's changing yeah uh, it looks a lot more and is starting to take a shape that looks to me like impact investment mm-hmm. rather than let a few ideas flurry and see what happens and yeah and then seed the best maybe i i I think i've seen that starting to change i know it's really hard to record everyone says impact no one knows exactly how to define it uh but i'm wondering in terms of evolution you know when you start to think about those changes too what does that do to organizations especially in these federated models like if if you start to your job was 1800 different local united ways I can imagine the way they operate in San Francisco, New York, and Tulsa. Yeah. Or Honolulu. It's all very different. Yeah. Right. But they still have some core that that the central group can can manage, you know, in that sort of federated model. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Like though, is that is, is there were there lessons you took away from that? If we thought about mergers and acquisitions, I don't know if there's any other way to call it in this space, but yeah, I mean, in that example, I it, it's I know that a, a lot of options were looked at, um, and some of them were perhaps is there a need to yes to do some consolidations. What where things wound up was, and I think this is good, although it's still they're in a very messy stage still because these changes are big. They are centralizing some of the back office things. So 1,800 local United Ways, each of them had their own um, email, each of them had their own finance, each of them had their own CEO. Um, So basically 1,800 different organizations all just kind of federated, tied together by brand, sort of a franchise, perhaps, model. Um, And that might be quite accurate. But but in any case, you know, they they have had the, the foresight and the vision of like, how can we streamline? But it's messy and it's complicated and it's hard because then you start dealing with people who have jobs and careers and their own passions and beliefs on the other end of that. Um, And uh, yeah, I caught up with one one of my old colleagues recently and they're still just, they're working through it. It's it's just messy 
it's the hard stuff, right? But, it, but that's the thing. It's like, yeah, anything worth solving is going to be hard. It's going to have people attached to it. Um, and particularly in the mission driven space, I think you are spot on that there is this sort of um, consolidation that's happening anyways, whether you want it or not, just that's kind of how um, those that contribute donors, you know, they don't really want to interact with a local United Way per se. The internet makes it very easy for them to just find the cause that they care about locally and mm -hmm. give. Um, so it's either like hyper local or it's very big, it would seem. Um, yeah, that was an interesting time. Yeah, so it's just, you know, the, the prep, the two, the, the, when we had talked biomimicry and where my head went to and I was writing yeah. this piece and I just don't have to finish is big ideas, right? And it got me into, I think a lot of organizations and right now they're, they're really being forced out of it, but stagnation creeps in really quickly. And I'm calling it stagnation, but you call it status quo. Mm -hmm. To me, they're, they're one in the same and it's hard to tell when you're in it, right? I mean, we have these same numbers that looks good and we still have money coming in. That's good. Yeah. I think those that were really getting by on the status quo in the middle of add this pandemic, add the stress of trying to figure out how to run a remote organization overnight yeah. um, and then trying to catch up with all of your constituents at the same time. Anyone who had just been status quoing it, I think is probably going to feel that a lot more than those who might've been willing to say, what are the big ideas? Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking for small animals when they needed to survive in nature, what do you do? You make yourself look really big, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a protection mechanism. Mm -hmm. I, I think of that less in terms of like the attack or someone, these organizations going under, but more, you need the big ideas to motivate your staff to get past the status quo, to get out of stagnation, to get yeah. moving towards the future. And, you know, I, like a, this too shall pass, this virus will go away, things are gonna come back, we're all gonna hang out again at a bar someday, probably yeah. in a couple months, it's gonna be great. Yeah. I'm gonna go to a concert. But what, what were the big ideas that are gonna get you through this to that next place, you know, and, and transformation and, and evolution, and, and even with the biomimicry, with the wayfinding, yeah. I think, as humans, we constantly always remove ourselves from the environment equation as if we're not part of that evolution that got us here over time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, in the wayfinding, is it there's sensing that goes on, right? If you're really in tune, like, hey, I could feel the weather coming. Uh-oh, maybe I'm going to chill out while the storm comes. Right. Right. Oh, maybe I'm not going to try to cross the river because all this rain just happened. Yeah. Like, getting out of the that there has to be a set path transformation is messy yes organizational evolution is messy and yeah. we are creatures and it involves people so how which is totally true so so then i guess where my mind's going here is like how do you how do you cultivate those skills right that sort of awareness and that because it's a bit of intuition right there's there's that combination of like intuition but knowing when to like when to lean into ambiguity and then when to wrestle with it and start bringing some clarity and certainty, you know? And I think that part, part in part might be why I gravitated away from like project management as a formal discipline because it always felt very binary and rigid. You know, here's the project plan the schedule and follow this and, and you know, you're going to engineer it and it's out the other side and you're done. Um, but the world is messier than that. And and this, this is um, just in thinking about my own career. It's a challenge I, I have also had, right? It, there's, there's not really, there isn't a market for like, or there isn't a title that you put on LinkedIn that is like, get shit done. You know what I mean? You take, <laughs> right? Like take crazy, messy things, um, put some order to it, you know, and by the way, have a good enough handle on how much order versus too, you know, not enough. And, you know, like one, I, a lesson I learned when I was at the Nature Conservancy, we had a big project there where we were going through a, uh, an agile transformation, right? Like software development, rebuilding our agile processes, dual track, discovery and delivery, all these beautiful words. And we were so in love with that process. And it was beautiful. It was elegant. And then, you know, we really let the problem that we were trying to solve get away from us. So it ended up being that we had a well-engineered, and this is common, right? A well-engineered um, solution for a problem that didn't exist. But the process that got us there was great. Oh, man, yeah, that's... And, and, 
so I kind of threw a few things in there, but it is what I, I wrestle with. It's just this like, how do you, like what is the market or how do you cultivate, or is there even a market for that sort of softer wayfinding skill set that seems really valuable, you know? Like every job that I've, once I've gotten in the door, people are like, oh my God, I'm so glad you're here. Here's, you know, here's some messy stuff. <laughs> right. Help us out. Yeah, I've had a lot of the, I don't know what you do. And then when I was about to leave, they're like, please don't leave. Yeah, right? Um, yeah. It's, and it's, and I, and I did spend a lot of time thinking about this. Someone, how do you bottle the X Factor? You know, we had a client who came to us, they changed jobs, um, got stuck in a messy bit of a, an effort, came to one of our happy hours, and he's like, I, I don't know anyone else who does this. I don't even know how to describe it, but I need you to come in and help. Right, and that, that felt good to me personally, but then I thought about my company and I'm like, how do I describe this publicly? Yeah. Right. Because it's not just an it factor. It's not just because Tony knows how to do that one thing. I think it's, I think there is a type of discipline. I do think it's this multidisciplinary mm -hmm. in integrator type that you can bring in the people who have the hard focus on numbers and we were supposed to be somewhere in two weeks. Why aren't we there? I, right. I think you need that analytic approach you know, that those type of analysts, I think you need the big dreamer on the other side that's saying, why can't I do this amazing big idea thing? And then somewhere in the middle, you facilitate it to, to push it forward a little. Yeah. I, I'm, I've been where you've been too, where it's like you, you've planned so intensely for so long to put out the most perfect thing. And then it just fails to deliver. Yeah. It's like sometimes when you go on one of those vacations, you've been waiting for forever to see some monument and you get there and it's like, oh. That's it? <laughs> right. It's, it's, uh, you realize, you know, you, you start to realize it's the journey, not the destination, but nonetheless, like, um, how, so I, I think that's it. How do we, how do, I really like that too. I mean, how do you balance, none of us like the ambiguity. I mean, that's what's making this moment so scary is there's, mm -hmm. it's people are getting sick, which is frightening, and, but there's misinformation and it's something we don't know. So it's new and there's this unknown. Mm -hmm. And you're adding the two things that really just rattle people. Big time. This is, I mean, this is the moment I think where transformation has to come into these organizations. This, you are also facing that. Like, uh, what's the future of work? Yeah. Where are we going? What What do we need from a policy organization in 2020 and 2025? Right. What are yeah. the boundaries and the borders? And can we start solving things instead of talking about them? You know, do, do we get to a place where we're solutions oriented above, I just need to stay in this role. You and I had talked about, again, in the nonprofit space, shouldn't we all be trying to not be in a job? Mm -hmm. right? right. So, and I, I get that could come across as crass and, you know, I, what I'm saying, I appreciate all the hard work that goes into it. I mean, people are really doing great work, but eventually we want to solve the thing. Like we want yeah. a disease, we want a disease to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, but I guess, yeah, I don't know what that's making you think about and, and how do we get back into, uh, are we tying this yeah. enough into biomimicry? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So that honestly is kind of where my, this recent fascination I've got with biomimicry is, is kind of rooted, right? It's like this, so prefacing it, so biomimicry is supposed to be like innovation inspired by nature. We talked about this, right? Like, Nature's got 3.8 billion years of R&D. It's really figured out how to solve some pretty nasty problems um, and using readily available materials at, you know, air temperature, a little bit of water, right? Like I think we, we, we talked about that example of like spider silk being about five times stronger than steel and made of what, crickets and water and some carbon or something, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, um, but what... What I find fascinating about it is that it also seems to kind of hold like a root cause solution, right? So rather than, uh, and so here's where I'm kind of going with it. Like, um, this is still kind of loose in my head, but there's, there's, been, a, there, there's been plenty of emphasis recently, maybe in the past, I don't know, 10 years, let's say, on really how to get people demanding a better world, right? Like the world's a mess, put pressure on the businesses and the politicians to have better products and better policies, and therefore we can protect the environment and things are gonna get better. 
And, and a lot of the advocacy work and that storytelling work has been successful. You've got people that um, have been influenced and they've, they've created that demand. So if you think of like supply and demand, we've taken this demand curve and we've sh shifted it, yeah? And then on the other side though, you've still got supply in kind of its same old place. And there's nobody really pushing on the supply side of things. You've got businesses that are responding to this demand with CSR kind of stuff and um, you know, with more sustainable products. And so that caters to people who are willing to pay a premium for, for those things. But it, it hasn't really fundamentally shifted the, like the, the raw inputs into those supplies. We still pull those things out of the ground, heat, beat, and treat is kind of the, the mantra you hear of how we, our, our industrial revolution processes, right? And so that got me to think of, of look, nature's been around for quite a while figuring out quite a lot of complex things. You can look at, um, I mean, like a quick example is I think the abalone, uh, the um, shell is harder than our porcelain in our, in our teeth, or it's hard, harder than any kind of porcelain we could manufacture. And it's just, you know, again, made out of like calcium and carbonates and water. Like how could you, you we get inspired by the way that nature produces these materials? Um, building on, on this a little bit, the, the question that I had that kind of got me on this path was like, it's been vexing me for a long time. I've been in this business of, of trying to get people to care about a better world. You know, like one of the earliest gigs I had here was at a local design, well, you and I met at Three Spot, right? So yeah, and even before that, it was this kind of like creativity with a conscience kind of work. Um, I feel that perhaps we, we've really saturated that market. The people that are gonna care, or the type of people that are gonna care, they care. And we're not really, we might be, as people kind of enter or exit, we might be bringing new people in, but the, the size of that group isn't significantly changing. And so maybe it would, what we need is a way to ensure that we have a, a good planet that doesn't even require people to care, right? So what if the products that you bought and the lifestyle that you lead um, all of those decisions and all those choices created a better planet because the cup of coffee that you buy is 100% compostable or the plastic bag is actually not made of, poly of, of oil. Uh, it's, you know, it's made of some sort of cellulose, right? Like there's just those, or, or the clothes that you buy are actually mostly wood fiber instead of cotton or the color on your car actually isn't paint. It's, um, it's colored through structure, just like how butterflies and beetles give color, not through pigment, but through the way that their cells refract light, hmm. you know, like that kind of stuff. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's just, there's a lot of opportunity there. So what, what about, um, what if you had shoes for kids that grew with their feet instead of having to buy new shoes all the time? Yeah, that'd be nice. Right? <laughs> there's a guy right now that has figured out how to make, cement blocks um which is basically you know it's like co2 and, and and some water and i'm getting it a little bit wrong but but basically he's taking a byproduct of, of some of our processes and then converting it into a construction material um hmm. so anyway I'm, I'm not quite getting this all exactly right because i'm still new in my learning on this topic right. but i just find it really fascinating that rather than continuing with these old industrial revolution processes and continuing to invest a lot of R&D in how we might rip out more shale or you know, cut more from the forests, are there ways that we could pump that kind of resources into ways that are, are, are a little more aligned with just kind of how nature works and still get the same utility, the same disposability, the same affordability, the same convenience? The answer seems like they're like it's getting closer and closer to yes. Um, and, and in my mind, I see this, like there's like, there's almost a business opportunity where you've got industries or, you know, parts of the economy that are dirty, you know, that just kind of pollute a lot where you've got these sustainable substitutes that are already being produced and where they're, you know, commodities, they're in everyday use, you kind of hit that intersection. And, and, and um, that seems like a good, early place to start 
rethinking um, the direction our, our economy could go, you know, and finding new business opportunities. Carrying that a little further, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's also a gap between the kind of traditional STEM academic curriculum mm -hmm. and then what you do once you come out on the other side and have to get a job. Mm, you know, most yeah. of these engineers end up getting into um, those high paying defense contractor, at least around this area, right? In the DC area, like you, you end up fairly fast tracked into jobs that pay well, but you know, there's not much connection to the environment. So what if we were re-engineering and rethinking how we, we create our materials and, and they're more affordable, those types of engineering opportunities because they're tied to viable, marketable products, right? There's gotta be more of a business, there's, there's a business need. Like those would still be well-paying. Um, Cause that was the other thing that's been wrestling, I've been wrestling with is how can you still do the right thing for the planet and not have to sacrifice your well-being, your income, right? Like your livelihood. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, there's like, let's, let's stop denying that, look, you know, people, they need to, to take care of themselves and their family. And I, I struggle with this in that, after 20 years of working for nonprofits, you know, you start, sometimes you feel like a chump. You're like, hmm, <laughs> yeah, sure pays well, but. Um, right, right. Yeah. Well, don't feel like a chump, man. There, there's a lot of us in the fight. Well, I, we we, we, we got to stay there. You're like, wow, it's like, it's, it it's, is not a path to wealth. No, it's not. But then I, you make a lot of strong points here. And I, I think there's, there's part of this evolution that, that's got to happen, right? These big ideas are the things that are whatever, massively changing right. societal impacts. And this is why you get up in the morning, right? I, I don't know too many people who wake up and think, man, if I could just sell a couple hundred more cheeseburgers, then I'll make another million dollars. Like, that's what I've always wanted to do. Like, little me wanted to be that person. I, I think yeah. little, little me wanted to be a world-changing ideas person or someone who yeah. was on a fire truck helping out in a time of need. I, I think everyone, I like to believe in the, in the best of all of us and that, that we, there is intrinsic altruism through us as a human yeah. uh, society that, that we, we do want to do better. It's just, we, we put, we pit the wrong incentives out there and we, we pit ourselves against the societal incentive of you should have this thing. You should have this type of thing instead of how do we do this together and, and get something big. Mm -hmm. out the door i i think you have made a good point a little while ago though which is you know in the idea of how do we help the environment with people with habits they already have without having to try to change them because change yeah. is hard. change management is it's incredible brutal. right um, yeah. and now you, now you're and then you're saying do that on a global scale that's what we are literally saying today march 17th 2020 everybody stop what you're doing change all of your habits and patterns yeah. immediately for the unbeknownst time of two to eight weeks uh th 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 we're not saying even do that for a lifetime right we're saying for like half a month to two months right. just do something different and it's a struggle like it, it's it's going to be hard so I, I like the idea of what are people doing and how do we meet them there can we create packaging that to your point i might not be thinking about the environment at that time but i didn't have to because someone yeah. else somebody else did and made the product and now that product is in a sustainable place that I don't have to worry about that. Because, you know, if I think back to the teams and the organizations and, and the mission-driven sector in general, like sooner or later it's going to be something that you can do. I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Andrew's got that. Yeah. Like what? Because totally. you can't worry about all of it because then you'll be paralyzed. Exactly. Right. But that's kind of what's happening right now with a lot of this, you know, conservation stuff. I mean, you, um, the average recycling bin in your average office right there's like four slots for for all these different things like which one i don't know yes, yes. Um, I, if anyone's listened to this show and has heard me talk that is the one thing I'm, in this world i actually want to solve which is nuts I, yeah it's, it's different state by state it's different country by country it's different everywhere and so that i mean honestly that was kind of the experience i'm like why should this even matter why are we pushing this burden on people when you know what i mean we're expecting them to change the behavior and the outcome of that is they're not gonna you know, right. um, or they might when there's not as much going on in life. But I know from my own experience, you know, before kids to young children to, you know, the kids I've got now, it's it's uh, the, those pressures and demands on your time. You get to the point where, you know, you're like, 
uh, it's just quicker and easier to pull out the paper plates for this dinner party rather than, you know, doing yet another round of, of dishes or whatever. I mean, those are small things, but on a small scale, all that stuff magnifies, right? Like what if you could just do those things that are convenient and affordable and, it, and in so doing, the planet's all good. You don't gotta worry about it. We got you covered. No, that'd be great. It'd be great. You can still do the behavior change. There's still a need for storytelling. There's still a need for policy. There's still a need for that stuff. Um, but I do, I do fundamentally think that there's a group of people that those tactics, the storytelling and the advocacy is just not gonna reach. So why should we expect it to reach them? Why not just reach them, like you said, where they are, you know? Yeah, how do we start taking the initiative to meet people where they're at and have those big ideas to move it forward instead of just, now I have to go convince another 100 million right? people to do something different tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I'm really stuck on these like these basic economic theory principles, you know, like the was it the, mar the diminishing marginal returns, and I really I, I I'm just I feel like that's where we're at right now with a lot of these the storytelling and these tactics. They're great, keep at it, but you know, to try to get that final little bit of people, you're going to have to have infinitely more resources because you've already got the ones that you're going to get easily. Mm. And then you got you to, like, the story that you're telling right now is going to work for the rest. So, you know, you got to tell a different story. Well, that's a whole new ramp up of, um, of, of creativity and um, engagement. And, and maybe it's not going to be on social media. Maybe you got to go to the NASCAR races and set up a booth. Or, you know what I mean? Like, it's a very different yeah. approach. This is, it's interesting. I mean, this, you're, now you're, you're taking me full circle back. I mean, this literally is why we came up with the frame engagement architecture was I it was really heavily influenced by the book The Attention Merchants. Mm. Um and just man, I even it's this other book I just listened to recently too, Trust Me I'm Lying, uh, about media manipulation. Um has really also so the attention merchants got me thinking if if everyone's just trying to buy attention and you're trying to play in that space to your point right here, where I need to increase how many people I can reach. I need to get more of this message out there. That message doesn't do anything, man. Yeah, you have to then build an affinity with that one person you reached. And I saw this crazy stat at the time. I went and did a presentation after I read this book, and it was ninety nine dollars was spent on attention, one dollar was spent on conversion. Yeah, Out of, right. That that's just staggering, right? Yeah. That, to me, and I'm like, we gotta we gotta reverse that. If that's not even fifty fifty, that doesn't feel yeah. right to me. Because once yeah. I have you, then I have the opportunity to now build a relationship. And in my theory is. I've had this, I call it the bubble gum theory. I think of um, double bubble with the wrap because my uh -huh. wife uses it all the time, but it's, it's got two funnels and it's a big chewy middle. Yeah. Our old communication models were reach, engage, and impact. And I, <laughs> I would look at it and I'd be like, well, what happened? Like, you need me to come back. Uh -huh. So the bubble gum model to me is I get you in and I build that heavy infinity, give you something to chew on for a long uh -huh. time. And if I uh -huh. give you an action, come back with another friend. So I, I feel like, yeah, I mean, what you're hitting on to me really is about the engagement modeling, which is I, I have your attention. You actually care about my cause. How do I empower you to be an advocate for that? Yeah. And I've got to be okay with you taking some of my message as your brand. Like it's now you, like I'm, think, I'm Parsons TKO. You guys think we're the best. And now you're taking some of that brand to say, I read their materials. Look how smart I am. Mm-hmm. But go forward with it, right? And and, and move that forward. And I, I think that's something some organizations also need to get a better embrace of, which is how do I let my audience that I've built a relationship from start to amplify for me? Because I can't be in all places at all times with one single message and try to beat people who literally need a click to make a dollar. They will have salacious headlines. They will do crazy things. They will put stuff out that's not true. Like we're in the mission-driven space. We'll never compete with that. Right. We have to be tried, true, solid in our messaging, offering things where people are, building their relationship, but then giving the toolkit. And maybe this, to your point, is in nature and biomimicry, there's always the feedback loop or a feedback me mechanism, the sensing part we talked about earlier. This, uh, remember Web 2.0 was a term? Yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone's going to participate. Uh, but like it, it never really came to fruition and we never really, I still don't know any group that really does great listening to the audience on an idea. Like how, how do you do that? I mean, that people talk about engagement metrics with us and they're like, yeah, somebody liked my tweet. Eh, sort of mm -hmm. like engagement. Really? How many people are actually coming and giving you real feedback? 
not yeah. like I just copied and pasted something. Like I cared enough about what you put out. This is, and I tried to implement it in my community and here's what I yeah. found. And I don't even, I don't even know you, right? You were, yeah. and first of all, wow, thank you. Second, what's the feedback? And are, so is, I'm, I'm just thinking in the biomimicry big idea space is, do we need to start getting better at having these mechanisms once we know who our audiences are, once we know who's engaged with us, that we can actually start listening and incorporating what we're learning from what's, what's happening in the world around us as well. Yeah. Instead of to your yes. point earlier, here's the here's the job, executives, and I will get to point Dude. B by twenty twenty one. Hold on, I gotta hold I gotta hold up something here. All right. So this th not uh -oh. <laughs> this book. Is that right side up? Yeah. yeah, this book would be a great book for you. Um, it's like the textbook on human centered design meets biomimicry. And in 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 there, they talk about sort of abstracting the problem you're trying to solve, right? So getting kind of like, what's the feature or what's the function? Feedback loops, right? And then you start to look at what kind of feedback loops work in nature. You might need a little more detail than just feedback loops, like few feedback loops that, you know, I don't know, we have to brainstorm that out a bit. But anyway, then you start looking at how is that solved in nature? And that kind of, it, it sort of inserts in your research stage, you know, different biological models as reference points as mentor, as model, as coach, um, or as, as you know, some unit of measure. Uh, that, and anyway, so it's a really cool book in that it makes it very approachable and it just kind of blends the two disciplines together in a way that's actionable, right? So, if, you know, I think a lot of people are, are now more comfortable with human-centered design ways of, of solving problems and as not a, as a, like a dogmatic approach, but if, you know, a flexible, framework and that's kind of how this stuff plugs in there um so two things can you what's the name of the book it is called biomimicry resource handbook a seed bank of best practices by dana baumeister all right so we'll get the we'll get that name we'll get a link we'll get that in the the show notes here can you just for anyone who's listening because i feel like it's one of those terms that get tossed out and it's it's tossed out so much that to your earlier point people feel like they should know what it means so they don't uh -huh. ask yeah. Human, human centered design. Can you yeah. break that down a little um, bit for us? I mean, it depends on how deep you want to go on that, right? But that's just like when you are engineering a solution, solving a problem, rather than starting with the what do we want it to do, it's like it's really getting clear on who are you solving that problem for, mm. like having those humans at the middle, at the core of the solution, and at the core of you're like you're constantly thinking about that person. So, for example, on this, this Campaign for Nature project, you know, we got clear very early on that our, our focus is the elite audience. We're talking to people who are, we're going to preach to the choir, and we're really targeting the ministers of environment and the heads of state. And so that helps us for everything that we're putting out there. Will this resonate with that group? And even more specifically, you know, we because there's not that many of them, really, you know, it's like, who are the key countries we're after? Who are those specific individuals? And as we're putting together messaging, you know, does this meet the specific um, characteristics in that country, in that location? But, um, but there's a whole framework around, you know, how you can do the, the going broad and doing your research and then narrowing it down and then doing some testing and brainstorming and modeling. And, and you know, I, I, would, I, I am by no means an expert on this, right? I'm sort of the jack of all trades of frameworks of, of how to solve problems. But I've added that to my toolbox um, when I was shifting from agile software development and then into just kind of more broad-based program management, I felt those two work very well together because mm -hmm. the agile software world is really all about very quickly, iteratively working through problems, ideally focused on specific personas, but this stuff is really like, you know, get clear about who your customer is, you know, and what's that problem that they've got and, and don't lose sight of that. Right. Well, that's interesting. So do you, I mean, do we think it's, it's, I could see who are we solving this for really tying into a why and a goal. Mm -hmm. But yeah. then it, it, then you kind of push that into the section of, but it's the audience we're targeting too. Yeah. Is it one in the same, do you think? Ooh. I don't know. I may have met, kind of blended that. I mean, in this case, it kind of is in that, like we do have a, a secondary target with the general public. But 
we really are trying to make sure that those environment ministers and the heads of state publicly support what we're trying to do. And so if they don't feel, so for example, um, we were trying to run articles in our online uh, Nat Geo magazine. And some of the, this is kind of inside baseball here, but we're, we're right now gathering success stories from specific countries that we're trying to target. And so if we can present a very compelling image, like make this country look good because they've done great things for the environment, they'll be more likely to join our cause and, and support our position. Um, so a lot of like how we're, we're thinking about it is really who are we trying to influence, what's their current position, um, and how can we win them over? Seems a little manipulative, but. <laughs> well, but I mean, it, it could feel that way if you were doing it or if you were doing it obscured without knowledge without transparency yeah you know i i you know if somebody wants me to eat their hamburger it's okay if i get the advertisement and it comes over it's bad when you're putting it on my my kid's flyer that came home from school because he sponsored it right like i there's i mean i think there is manipulation and then i i think there is trying to convince people how to that that what you're doing is the right thing and when yeah. more critical thinking can be applied that that's how we get to the better places. You know, I, I'm very much of the Kantian philosophy, the power of a better argument should win. Yeah. I think as a society and as, and as working organizations, a lot of us have lost the ability of how to argue constructively. Mm. I think that's something we need to bring back as well. Like uh, disagreement isn't disrespect. Mm -hmm. it, you know, if everyone is suddenly in alignment and there never was anyone who had a, a differing opinion, like that's when I get really nervous. I'm like, that yeah. doesn't seem right. I can't yeah. believe everybody thinks the way I think. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that kind of hits a culture, right? Because not all places have that the culture where the challenge is welcomed, you know, right? I think uh, 100%. I think that's where there's... I think that's some of the dissatisfaction. I think that's some of the stagnation. I think that was where I, when I was thinking after our lunch about the, the big ideas yeah. and the biomimicry, it was that like, yeah. we, what's the crazy idea that's laughable? Yeah. You know, can, I have a friend, she started a consulting firm and she's bringing comedy into the boardroom, right? Can we make something laughable? Cause in comedy, people say really serious truths. Mm-hmm right that are uncomfortable mm -hmm. occasionally but they put it on the table in a way where it's not or it's disarming no, it's threatening yeah and now you can talk about it yeah and i think in a lot of organizations maybe pride goes before a fall i also i just think that uh the annual goals create occasionally disincentives for collaboration mm-hmm you have to achieve this and I have to achieve this. And oh my God, now we got to touch the same system, but I had Q1 planned and you weren't planned to Q3. And oh my gosh, we can never make this work, right? The, the Ghostbusters streams will cross and I don't know what will happen. Egon will have to tell us later. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, and when we think about, again, just, just tying our theme here, biomimicry and culture, like yeah. we are a culture and we have to learn how to start working together differently in these organizations and I, I it's interesting uh, when I took one of my first executive jobs and I talked to my father and he had sent me this email he's like well this is stuff I would usually say to people because he'd been doing it a lot longer than me so I took his advice one of those was hey all ideas it's basically the sum of all ideas are welcome and we want them on the table mm -hmm. but you also have to understand that we have to make decisions and those the, all your ideas might not be incorporated and mm -hmm. that doesn't mean we're not trying, that doesn't mean we don't respect what you were putting on the table, but we still have to keep this company and this organization moving forward. Yeah. And so it's not always going to be inclusive. There is going to be moments where something happens as a directive because speed is of the speed is a priority or that's just what needed to take place. But the goal is to get as many voices as you can always. And I, yeah. ha, you know, so I think this comes back to, you know, leadership. If we are, we are uh, social creatures, right? And we, who's who in those ranks? And we still will operate in a hierarchical society and we do tend to still respect that. Mm -hmm. But we need the leader at the top to be the kind of person who then in these change and transformation moments can adapt and open up. Yeah. People have to be willing to say, I'm willing to hear everything out there, not just to be right. 
how are you entering the conversation? And it, it's, it's so simple. People talk about open-minded, let's be open-minded. But to really be open-minded yes. is hard. Yeah. Right? Yep. You're coming yeah. in with you're coming in with a lot of baggage. And I I I so silo busting. I thought about with transformation, I, people used to call me a silo buster. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, silos are bad. And then I thought more again about integrating the work. And I'm like, no, you actually need what I'm calling verticals of knowledge instead of silos now. Yeah. I, just, I think it sounds better. But you, you need verticals of knowledge because people need career growth. They need to focus on a discipline. Maybe they're making a product. Maybe they're making a policy output. Maybe they're making a vaccine. They need to be inside of that, right? But yeah. the, uh, the, uh, the operational parts of the organization have to cut across all that. So yes, the communications professor, professional won't know exactly every detail you know about this vaccine, but they know how to get the message out. Yeah. They're an expert too. Yeah. So let's not have a food fight over yeah. how we're calling yeah. people experts. How do we integrate the work to make sure the whole organization and the objective yeah. goes forward? Yeah, I think we've, we've been all over the place here in this, in this conversation. So maybe our audience can see uh, you and I enjoy large, idea ambiguous conversations and they'd, do. they'd yeah. be willing to join us in one of these because it's not about having the answers it's about uh i think getting the right questions right yeah and, and just having that curiosity you know i mean yeah I'm, I, what this is leaving me with i want to i want to think more on the like what what sort of the like parallel in nature for that integrator function or purpose or role or you know to mull that one over a little bit but that's, you know, right? Because it's kind of, we keep coming, coming back to that is there's a gap, there's, there's a need and there is, but there's not this, like, it isn't a formal thing. You will never see a chief integrator job, right? Ever. I've been asked and I don't, know, I don't know what it is. I don't even know yeah. what the title is. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe there is some sort of parallel that might help kind of gel around like exactly what it is or make it, because I, I mean, seriously, I've always struggled in like, what do you do? I'm like, oh my God, I could get, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> you know, I've never have known how to really give a clear answer um, because it just comes across as there, there's just so many different things. Um, hmm. Is the integration element the one that passes through like water? Mm -hmm. the tree and the leaves and everything does what it's supposed to do. The water comes and goes, but it helps facilitate all of the action within it. Yeah. Mm. Not, it's not meant to be the tree yeah it's not meant to tell the tree how to make the leaves happen it's not meant to to think about when to shift if the sun's moving it's interesting i went through a whole deep exploration a while ago of like really um i wrote an article at one point it was like live like water and i was really getting inspired by sort of the, like the characteristics of of water you know um, we, that can be a whole nother conversation for another time but um but that's interesting that yeah you kind of bring that up because I see a lot of similarities there. There was a phase I had where I was reading the um, the Tao Te Ching. You know that book? The like the Tao Te Ching. Yeah, right? There was chapter eight was all about like water, and I had that printed out for quite a while. I was all into that. Um, I still, I mean, I think I, I feel like you know, well, I don't have it memorized. Those principles I still feel very attached to. Right. You know? Yeah. 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 That's interesting. So. What you say, so you've already given us one book to potentially read. Is there another favorite book of yours that you like to recommend or, or something that you're reading, even periodical now that you might recommend? And if so, well, well, what, do you, yeah, what do you like to read? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of comes and goes, right? Like definitely this biomimicry stuff has been um, where I'm at right now. But one that I do, really did love uh, a while ago, um, Dan Harris, it's like a news anchor guy. He wrote this book, 10% Happier. And it was really all about like meditation as a way of managing the stress, the ambiguity, the uncertainty, all the crazy. So that was helpful. Oh, and I just got a low battery notice, by the way, on my computer. So if you lose me, that's what's going on. All right. Uh, well, Dan Harris, 10% better. Yeah. It's happier. 10% happier. 10% happier. Yeah. Andrew Courtney, thank you for your time today. Yes. Uh, as always, folks, thank you if you've made it through. Uh, it was We were ambiguous, but we, we hopefully <laughs> got some ideas. and we got maybe? Yeah. 
but it, please, please give us a comment. Leave a comment here on YouTube if you're watching it there. Leave a comment on our blog. Reach out to us on email. You know, it, I think it could be fun if some of you would like to join us. We could go remote, social distance, and have a nice Zoom session and, and continue this conversation because it's something I'm really interested in, and I think it has implications and uh, applications uh, for all of our organizations uh, moving forward. Virtual lean coffee, you know, where you just bring people together and like. I like it. Yeah. Well, well, maybe we'll set that up. I, but I, I appreciate it. And thank you, audience. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Tony. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Take care.